This inscribed wooden tablet is full of stories. To be more precise, it is by far the earliest family letter in China. With only a hundred or so characters, it recounts the legendary exploits of the Qin army more than 2,000 years ago. In the winter of 1975, archaeologists found this wooden tablet in a tomb at Shuihudi, Yunmeng County, Hubei Province. The occupant of the tomb was named Chong, presumably a low-ranking state of Qin official. The letter, written in the late Warring States period, is the earliest physical evidence for the existence of family letters in ancient China. The person who sent this letter was a Qin soldier named Hei Fu, Hei Fu, on his own behalf, as well as that of Jing, his second brother, wrote this letter to Zhong, his eldest brother. Hei Fu, this time, I still have to pay for my family's money. I'll pay for my mother's money. When I get the letter, please pay for my mother's money. I'll pay for my mother's money. If I pay for my mother's money, I'll pay for my mother's money. His plain request for money and clothes raises a question. Didn't the Qin army provide uniforms for its soldiers? The Qin terracotta warriors in Xi'an, Sha Xi province, showed thousands of soldiers wearing armor and shoes of uniform pattern. This attire was customized to create an exclusive military outfit. At Shuihudi, archaeologists excavated another tomb, owned by a public servant called Shi. The legal documents among his burial objects offer more clues regarding military outfit during this period. At that time, military supplies, including food and armor, were provided by the army. The outerwear was also customized by the government. But what about what soldiers wore underneath? In Classic of Poetry, there's a famous verse. Say you, you have no clothes to wear. My long robes let me with you share. In this context, robe refers to underwear. 
According to Qin Dynasty law, undergarments were not provided by the army. As summer approached and the days grew hotter and hotter, He Fu on the frontier needed something light to wear beneath his military attire. Where was Hua Yang located? Which battle did He Fu and Jing fight? In 223 BC, when Ying Zhang, king of the state of Qin, was conquering the other six states, he encountered a massive setback. After defeating the states of Han, Zhao, and Wei, a young general named Li Xin led a Qin army of 200,000 to attack the state of Chu. It was a massive disaster for the Qin, resulting in the loss of almost all their troops. Ying Zhang, having no other choice, placed his hopes of unifying China on Wang Jian, an experienced general. Wang Jian informed the king that he needed an army of 600,000, almost all the male population fit for military service. For Ying Zhang, this was a war he simply couldn't afford to lose. Ever since the days of the Shangyang reforms, 100 years earlier, unification had been on the cards. Ying Zhang thought he was the man destined to make that unity a reality. Fu and his brother Jing were two of the soldiers in the 600,000 Qin army led by Wang Jian. At the time, of three males in a family, two were required to join the army. So their eldest brother stayed at home to take care of the family, and the two younger ones were enlisted. Shodoshin 中文字幕志愿者李宗盛 was eager to know whether his family had received the credential for the title of nobility indicating that the brothers had achieved military contributions. They wish records the letter Jing wrote to his brother. Jing, Wellhu 
，愿儿只能拜托大哥教导，告诉他打柴时不要去太远的地方，一定让他注意安全。你们在祭拜神灵时，如果得到夏夏钱，不要惊慌，只是因为我身在盼城而已。The content of the letter indicates that Jing's letter arrived home six months later than Hei Fu's. At that time, Hua Yang had been taken and they were encamped in the town. But since then, they had lost contact with the family. These two family letters were found in Zhong's tomb. In ancient times, Chinese people believed that the soul of a person never perished, so they tended to place valuable items in their tombs. This indicates that these two letters mattered to Zhong very much. It's likely that they did so because Hei Fu and Jing died on the battlefield and never came home again, making these letters the last link with the two brothers. What comforted them is that the title of nobility they attained went into effect. Zhong and their family were thus able to live a better life. In the end, the state of Qin defeated the state of Chu. Two years later, the Qin Empire was founded. In the Emperor Qin Shi Huang Mausoleum Museum, the terracotta warriors served as a miniature of the then mighty Qin army. The warriors were molded based on real figures, but nobody can tell which one is Hei Fu and which one is Jing. Hei Fu was supposed to have been a lad with a dark complexion, while Jing was reputed to be a reckless person with a loud voice. Soldiers like them, despite their indispensable contribution to the unification of China, remain nameless in historical records. Today, thanks to the two wooden tablets, we are fortunate to get to know two of the innumerable warriors who made unification possible, Hei Fu and Jing. It is thanks to soldiers like them that the marvelous dream of unification finally came true. What were the days like on the northeastern border of China more than 2,000 years ago? The north wind and the moon were the same as today's. The garrison soldiers and the civilians were also living like us, playing jokes with each other and experiencing ups and downs in life. With low salaries and suffering from occupational illnesses, they stood as an unyielding shield for the safety of the territory. Yosun,还有Yosun,媳妇,你们都好吧。在赛上生活,还是辛苦。暑天的时候,Yosun,媳妇,一定要留意衣食。在赛上, 务必谨慎行事。This is a letter from Zhu Yian Han slips, recording the correspondence between Xuan, a Han Dynasty official, and his friends, the Yo Suan couple. In 1930, archaeologists found over 4,000 wooden slips from the Han Dynasty in Jinta County. Jiu Chuen, Gansu Province. These wooden slips are mostly documents about border defense and agriculture, with a few items of private correspondences included. Xuan's letter is one of them. 
Because the excavated spot belongs to the ancient Juyan region, these wooden slips are referred to by historians as the Juyan Han Slips. Over 2,000 years ago, in the times of Emperor Wu of Han, General Huo Chu Bing led a mighty army of cavalrymen to conquer the Juyan region. After defeating the Xiongnu Nomadic Confederation, the Hexi Corridor ceased to be an impediment. To prevent the comeback of the Xiongnu, Emperor Wu gave the order to build a wall along the Juyan region, send troops there, and establish an administration system. Besides, it marked the beginning of a nationwide wave of immigration, of which the destination was the Juyan region. Military, government officials, soldiers, and immigrants flooded in, leaving their homes and settling on the border, building a solid defense for the territory. Hoyo 有苏恩 and 有都 were brothers. Xuan was close to them both, and perhaps they had ties of kinship. They were all border soldiers, but stationed at different checkpoints. One thing is for sure, the Yosuan couple lived in Jingguan. In the Han Dynasty, in order to pacify the homesick soldiers, the authorities encouraged bringing families to the border. There were three types of border soldiers, beacon soldiers, peasant soldiers, and cavalrymen. The cavalrymen were the elite, constantly on the alert for possible Xiongnu attacks, and they were of the highest rank. The Han Dynasty cavalrymen were different from those in medieval Europe, who were by and large aristocrats. The Han cavalrymen came from ordinary families, but they were courageous, skilled in archery, and adept at horse riding. The peasant soldiers were recruited from inland areas, cultivating land most of the time, but putting on armor to fight when an emergency occurred. The beacon soldiers, largest in number, undertook the most difficult tasks. Yo Suan was a beacon soldier. A few of his ilk were stationed in a beacon tower. As the first line of defense for the state, they needed to keep alert at all times. When they noticed the enemy's approach, they set up the beacon fire to send out the alarm. The weather on the border was harsh, scorching in summer and freezing in winter. Due to the inhospitable climate, the beacon soldiers were prone to illness. In the Ju Yen Han slips, there are many references to typhoid fever, and treatments for it are also mentioned. Besides this disease, another recurrent condition was patient swelling and festering in the belly, ribs, joints, legs, and feet. These symptoms indicate that scurvy was a problem for soldiers on the border. The Juyan region was composed of deserts and wasteland, so fresh fruit and vegetables were in short supply. Due to the lack of vitamin C, residents were prone to suffer from diseases such as scurvy.
informed than Yo Sun, so he could disclose to the young man a few messages, such as when the officials would come to the beacon tower to make a routine check. He advised Yo Sun to get prepared ahead of time. His words sound no different from the elders, exhorting youngsters in this day and age. It's as if they had never faded away in history, but were standing right before us. An ancient letter brings back a memory from 2,000 years ago of life on a faraway frontier, casting daylight on history and bringing warmth to our hearts. Everybody can be a poet when missing home. In the Tang Dynasty over 1,000 years ago, a young man named Zhao Yixian, without smartphones or WeChat, sent a letter to his mother living afar. Words so touching that they rival every single piece in the 300 Tang poems. Anya. 听说大哥官至云奇位，我和居子很欢喜。小妹改嫁给张龙旭，我和居子也都知晓。阿娘莫再托人烧东西了，好好留着自己用。我和居子啊，像离群的鸟儿，在陌生的土地上筑巢，
他们都孝顺，把阿娘大哥照料得很好，从无抱怨，一生很感激。As a sojourner in Luoyang, Zhao Yishen was living a rather difficult life. It can't be told by the letter what job he was doing. It seems that in order to console his mother, he avoided mentioning hardships, only telling her that life was getting better every day, and that he would soon be in a position to send money back home. After settling down in Luo Yang, Zhao Yishen's correspondence with his mother never ceased. Even though the contents of the letters were always generally very much the same, they were comforting and heartwarming. Ah,娘啊，你收到这封信的时候，约莫已是早春二月，那时候天气已经转暖，身体会好一些吧。阿娘九月初五送出的信啊，我十二月初三就收到了。听说嫂嫂和阿娘在一块儿生活，我我实在是高兴得很呐、啊。我让张明德、马道海帮我捎去一些布料。His words indicate that it took at least three months to send a letter from Luo Yang to Gao Chang. The ancient time mailing system is called Yi Chuan, which was set up by the government for document transferring and material transportation. The highest speed of Yi Chuan in the Han Dynasty was 200 kilometers per day. In the Tang Dynasty, it was required that the orders given by the emperor must be delivered at a speed of 250 kilometers a day. In the Qing Dynasty, after the establishment of the Grand Council, 400 kilometers in one day was the speed for the transport of important documents. Due to the limited capacity, however, ordinary people were not able to use the state-owned mailing system. Folks could only ask acquaintances to carry the letters to the destination. A poem from the Han Dynasty puts it like this. A guest came a long way to my house and brought two carps to me. I called my child to cook the fish, but found a letter in the stomach of it. It described a story about sending letters through acquaintances. Zhao Yishen asks someone to bring a bolt of cloth to his mother, telling her to keep a portion for herself, and then divide it and give it to his sister and relatives accordingly. was excavated from tomb number five. A young man named Li Huoji was also one of the migrants. Compared with Zhao Yishen, he was less of a devoted son. Father, <laughs> 妻子六月份又要生，不知是男孩是女孩。贞观二十年七月，花七千五百文买了个壶币。贞观二十一年正月，又花钱盖了房子。手头，哎，实在是没钱，没能给父亲母亲捎去什么。我很惭愧。Zhao Yishen and Li Huji are merely anonymous drops in the ocean. Their lives are unchronicled, but their correspondence has outlived time and perpetuates their life experiences down to the present day. The unadorned language puts flesh on history, 
which is abstract and desolate by nature, making the passage of time easier to comprehend. Perhaps Zhao Yishen returned to his hometown in later years. Her name is untraceable, but she signed as Arn Young Chu in her letters to her mother. In the Tung and Song dynasties, the young lady was referred to as Young Chu, which resembles the present day daughter or girl. Later than Zhao Yi Shen, this adorable girl also came to the Central Plains from the Northwest. The discovery of this family letter is remarkable. Before the People's Republic of China was founded, when Xu Zhengyao, a scholar, was examining ancient archives in Duanhuang, he accidentally found a special Buddhist script, on the back of which was written a letter. Our predecessors, sometimes when they were fixing a damaged book, pasted discarded paper on the back of a volume. But this piece of discarded paper was by no means mere rubbish. It turned out to be a letter from thousands of years ago. Such a neat handwriting and the sincere feeling she expressed immediately moved the scholar who remarked, this thousand-year-old piece of paper was even more valuable than our precious jade ring. Upon looking up the calendar of all the years with a third lunar leap month, the year 980 AD looks like the most probable one. According to the history of Song, in the spring of this year, the envoys from Dunhuang were sent to pay tribute to the central government, and the royal receiving date was set on the 28th of the third lunar leap month. Paying tribute was an important event requiring diligent preparation. The date of writing was the 20th day after Arn Yong Zhu had arrived at the capital. It is possible that she came a long way to the capital. Today's Kai Feng, accompanying her husband, who was an envoy. In the Northern Song Dynasty, it was common for envoys from the Western regions to bring their families along with them. Female relatives, like Arn Yong Zhu, were major interviewees for official historians, providing them with details such as scenery, and tales from exotic lands.
。本来还想多寄些食物，但又怕送不到，没敢多寄，可不要嫌少啊。二娘子敬上，六月二十一日。Official documents and cloth were foldable, and were often transported in a folded triangular shape. The mailing system was established for transferring government papers. So even though it had become well developed in the Sui and Tong dynasties, private items were barely allowed to be delivered by the mailing system. But from the letter, we can tell that R. Nyong Zhu often used the postal service for private purposes. Such a change was credited to Emperor Taizong of Song, during whose rule government officials were allowed to use the system to mail their personal belongings as an addition to the official documents. Since that period, the state-owned mailing system had spread to every corner of society. Ar Nyong Zhu was lucky to be among the first to benefit from this service. The two kids, upon receiving the gifts from their aunt, must have been overjoyed. The mother, who had heard from her daughter, must have been the happiest mother in the world. It remains a mystery why this letter drifted to the library cave for Buddhist scriptures. But such a coincidence has enabled us to catch a glimpse of the life thousands of years ago, and to get to know such a lovely girl named Ar Nyong Zhu. Her pining for home was overflowing, and she was also keen on traveling and adventure. She must have been good at words, telling the official historians about the outlandish stories of the border area and the remote desert, leaving a colorful and vigorous trace in history. This is written in Sogyan a Central Asian language on the verge of extinction. 1700 years ago, around the Wei and Jin dynasties in Chinese history, a Sogdian woman named Mune wrote this letter in Dunhuang to Nanai Dat, her husband. But Nanai Dat didn't receive the letter. Neither did he read the last sentence of it. I would rather be a dog's or pig's wife than yours. I想你跪拜,如同在神前匍匐,我为你祈福,我的丈夫奈奈德。能看到你健康快活,我的每一天都是好日子。能听闻你安然无恙,我的生活也就还撑得下去。In 1907, British archaeologist Mark Oral Stein discovered a postal package in the site of an ancient Chinese beacon tower dating back to the Han Dynasty. Stein thus unlocked the mysterious history of a whole tribe. A total of eight paper-based letters were found in the package, of which letter number three was written by Mune. Scholars decoded the mysterious characters and ascertained that these letters were by far the earliest and most complete written records of the Sogdians. These letters, written in the Sogdian language, were sent from Dunhuang and Wei to major places on the Silk Road, such as the Lowland Kingdom, 
and Samarkand. It can thus be inferred that over 2,000 years ago, a civilization called Sogdia played an active role on the Silk Road. Su Tu was their Chinese name, signifying the Central Asian region between the Amu Darya and the Sir Darya, which is in present-day Uzbekistan. The Sogdian people, from the Eastern Han Dynasty to the Song Dynasty, continually migrated to China along the Silk Road. They used the names of their home states as surnames. A total of nine states gave birth to nine different surnames, which was recorded in the Tang history as the nine Sogdian surnames of Chao Wu. Chao Wu was the name of the homeland. Nowadays, Chinese people with the last name An, Kang, Shu, Tao, or Mi are probably descendants of the Sogdians. Why did they migrate to China? For commerce. The Sogdian region was located in the junction of the west and the east, and it was the Sogdians who brought China the gold and silverware of Rome and Persia, as well as the gems and spices from India. Meanwhile, they transported Chinese silk and tea to the Western world, making themselves the most important cross-border merchants at that time. Central Asia and China stand thousands of miles apart, yet the Sogdians, carrying their families and belongings, established various transfer stations along the Silk Road and settled down in different commercial centers. In around 310 AD, Miu Ne and her husband, a Sogdian couple, went to Dunhuang. It was written by Shayan, Miu Ne's daughter, in the corner of the letter. The husband's disappearance left the mother and the daughter helpless, struggling, and living a wretched life. Dang 
All we know about this family is presented in the letter. But it is because of these written records that we can feel the warmth of the Silk Road. History should credit every single Sogdian person. They possessed nothing, but the entire world belonged to them. With an unparalleled aptitude for language and enthusiasm for trade, they traveled here and there as long as there was a profit. In the global history of commerce, the reputation of the Sogdians is no less than the Phoenicians and the Jews. They connected the West and the East and facilitated culture blending. They were favored by Chinese people and took a fancy to Chinese culture. After the 10th century, the Sogdian region was conquered by the Arabian Empire and their story came to an end. Death is inevitable for every mortal in the world. But what is even more difficult than death is that a husband and wife can keep each other company and go hand in hand till the end of time. Even if fortunate, they can join their hands in heaven. History has designed too many coincidences such as sending us Mune's letter and telling us her story. She is just like us. She was born, lived her life, and left her own traces in this world. These ordinary people have no monuments, no biographies. They have no more individuality than a drop in the ocean. Their writing, quite by chance, however, tells the story of their lives, bearing witness to the grand sweep of history. Today, following these clues, we touch the real pattern of life as it was lived in those far off days. Who can deny that insignificant people, just like you and me, play a role in creating history?